Welcome to Tangier. The guidebook I had on my first trip provided lengthy warnings of what to expect upon arriving in Tangier. Still, nothing could have prepared me for the welcoming I was about to receive as I stepped off the boat. Perhaps I should have paid closer attention to the literal plank we had to walk to disembark. But by then, it was too late. I looked up from where my feet had landed and discovered a throng of locals waiting outside the dock. It was a nightmarish scene, and my entire body tensed in dreaded anticipation of the gauntlet I was about to run. I looked around for another way out, only to confirm my fears. Unless I wanted to swim through the shark-infested waters back to Spain, I had to resign myself to my fate, each step heavier than the last, for reasons that had nothing to do with the weight of my backpack. As though my time had come to pay a long-forgotten karmic debt, I threw myself into the lynch mob, walking as quickly as possible without making eye contact with any of my would-be assailants. It didn't matter. Like a celebrity smothered by paparazzi, I was assaulted on all sides by an overwhelming barrage of unsolicited questions and insistent offers. All I could do was try to keep walking, which was no easy task. "'Welcome, friend!' said a man whose particularly aggressive tactics had somehow distinguished him from the rest of the crowd. Tall, dark, and greasy, with beady eyes, a long hooked nose, and a face that hadn't been shaved for days, he had obviously laid claim to me. All the other men fell back like children conceding victory to a departing train. Espanol? Hoping to walk the extremely fine line between neither encouraging nor offending him, without saying a word, I smiled half-heartedly, and kept going. Where are you from? The man attempted again, innocently, as though he harbored a secret hope we might someday be friends. When I still showed no signs of engaging, he ventured, Vous êtes français? There were, after all, only so many possibilities. He was going to go through each and every one until he stumbled upon the nationality that made my eyes light up. In spite of myself, a no slipped out. That was all. Nothing more. I couldn't help it. It was too hard to ignore someone, his motives notwithstanding, staring me right in the face. Besides, it was hardly an invitation to conversation. I hoped he would get the hint and give it a rest. But an invitation is exactly what my self-appointed host heard in my monosyllabic utterance. Whether I realized it or not, he had just got his foot in the door, and he wasn't about to waste any time before forcing himself inside. English! Are you English? American! he asked, with relief bordering on elation now that things were starting to go his way. I kept walking, once again falling mute, hating myself for having given in. Is this your first time in Morocco? I didn't know what to do. He was looming over me, encroaching so completely on my personal space that even my shadow was crowded out. His face was so close I could smell whatever was festering in his gut, and his eyes were open so wide all I could see were my own reflected back. There was no way to ignore him. It was only a matter of time before the pressure became too much, my manners again subjugating my sense of self-preservation. Yes, I replied as dispassionately as possible, still naively clinging to the hope he would pick up on my disinterest and leave me alone. Having already made two big mistakes, I had now made an even bigger one. I never should have admitted it was my first time in Morocco. I may as well have added... And since you were kind enough to ask, no one knows I'm here, I have no idea where I'm going, and I don't have a clue how much anything costs. Ah, wonderful, welcome, I will take you to a very nice hotel, the man said, rather than asked, suddenly distracted as though counting the piles of money destined to be his as the result of our fortuitous encounter. All the while, he kept in flawless lockstep with me as we left the port behind and began the steep climb toward the narrow, labyrinthine alleys of the old town, or Medina, imposing overhead. Under ordinary circumstances, it would have been challenging enough. I didn't know where I was going, and the Medina, its layout lacking any apparent logic, was sure to be difficult to negotiate for a newcomer. But these weren't ordinary circumstances. Dusk was fast approaching, and my unwanted companion's persistence flirted dangerously with belligerence. I decided to return to my initial tactic of saying nothing. If the two words I had said up until then had been misconstrued as gestures of goodwill, my return to silence was taken as a declaration of war. Why do you act this way? The man demanded, frustrated our budding friendship, which only moments before he had been convinced was on the verge of blossoming, not to mention bearing fruit, was suddenly threatened by the icy chill of my cold shoulder. 
I held my ground and said nothing. Why are you so paranoid? He pressed, raising both the pitch and volume of his voice. I now understood both sides of the game. If I so much as grunted, it was an open invitation to conversation. As long as he had me talking, the man figured he could eventually wear me down. If, on the other hand, I said nothing, he would take offense and try to either guilt or scare me into re-engaging. It was a no-win situation, and he had deliberately set it up that way. Are you racist? Unconvincing in his role as guardian angel, in his time, like mine, quickly running out, he had given up on the charade. His true colors now shined through. Again, I said nothing. My attention diverted to an almost more daunting concern. Somehow getting my bearings amidst the anarchy that opened up before me, a pit in my stomach opening up right along with it. We had arrived at the main plaza of the Medina, a chaotic crossroads. Hordes of people came and went up and down unmarked alleys, spinning off in all directions like twisted spokes of a wheel. Signs posted wherever the eye could see created more confusion than they gave direction, frustrating my frantic struggle to reconcile what I now saw with the map I'd committed to memory before getting off the boat. The chances of navigating the insanity on my own were next to nil. And that was exactly what the man was counting on. You must be Jewish, otherwise you wouldn't act this way, he sneered, oblivious to the irony of following up his previous comment with this one. I was at my wit's end. Before I even knew what I was doing, I dove into a tiny shop facing the plaza, a desperate, spontaneous move to throw the man off my trail. To my complete surprise, it worked. Excusez-moi, I beseeched, praying that the man standing before the floor-to-ceiling wall of reams and reams of colorful fabrics would be sympathetic. Je cherche l'hôtel McNess. The man said nothing. Instead, he smiled calmly, walked around the old wooden display case that had separated us until then, and took me by the arm back outside. Still smiling, he gestured for me to look up. The Hotel Meknes was right there, just across the little plaza. I had made it without realizing it, since in my confusion it hadn't occurred to me that the first floor of the hotel might not be located at street level. Even the sign was higher than I was likely to look, given all the others close to the ground, competing with it for attention. Immensely relieved, I thanked the man profusely. Without saying a word, he smiled again and made his way back inside. Once more on my own, I looked around anxiously, reassured to find that my escort from the port was nowhere in sight. The hotel entrance was out of sight, too, in an alley just off the plaza. The coast now clear, I headed towards it, praying there would be a room available. The welcome end of my journey nearly within reach, the relief of a cool shower, the security of a door locked behind me, the luxury of a large bed in which to stretch out my weary limbs, I stepped into the doorway, hesitating when I saw it was very poorly lit. No sooner had I done so than a man lunged at me from the darkness. What are you doing here? He demanded in French. I reeled backwards. The nightmare, it was instantly clear, was far from over. I'm sorry, uh, I didn't know what to say. Was I trespassing? Wasn't this the entrance to the hotel? I looked up. The sign was there. I was in the right place. What do you want? growled the man, inching closer, like a cougar about to pounce. Throwing his head back, he stuck his chest out in an even more threatening display of aggression. I, I'm, I'm here for a room. I, I'm, I'm going to the hotel, I offered, my French a muddled mess given my shock. There aren't any rooms. The hotel is full, the thug insisted, relaxing ever so slightly as he took satisfied note of my confusion. I had heard that line before. Actually, I had read it. The guidebook warned of con men who lied about one hotel being full so they could whisk their unsuspecting victims off to another that would pay a commission for customers delivered to their doorstep. This guy was obviously one of them. He was trying to make me feel I had done something wrong so he could then ease up, make friends, and offer to take me to another place that, as luck would have it, did have some rooms available. Still, being onto his ploy didn't make him any less of a threat. I looked up the staircase leading to the hotel lobby, out of sight somewhere above. This man was smaller than the first, but my mobility was restricted by a large backpack. I would hardly be able to defend myself if it came to that. On the other hand, we were just off a plaza full of people, and there should be more at the top of the stairs. Someone was sure to hear if I called out for help. Weren't they? Regardless, I resented being put in the situation, 
especially so soon after the first one, from which I hadn't even had a chance to recover. And I didn't want to give in to more lies and intimidation. So I decided to play dumb. Unknowingly using a ploy that more than one cab driver would later try on me, I suddenly forgot how to speak French. It helped that I hadn't done so very well initially. When the man said something else, I just looked at him even more confused. Tilting my head as though I hadn't understood, I responded in Spanish, No rooms? Really? Thank God he hardly spoke Spanish. Thrown by the unexpected change to the rules of engagement, the sinister expression the man had exhibited until then gave way to a generally perplexed one. He was now the one scratching his head, trying to figure out what was going on and how the tide had changed. I then knew for sure we were, in fact, playing a game. No, uh, hotel full, uh... He spoke louder than before, impulsively falling victim to that erroneous yet timeless notion that a language divide can be bridged by yelling across it. Although I no longer appeared to understand him nearly as well as I had mere moments before, I nodded vaguely as though some of what he said registered. Still, pretending not to get how definite he was, I flashed as confident and convincing a smile as I could muster and told him I was going upstairs to double-check, just to be sure. No, he began, visibly confused and increasingly frustrated, as he felt me wiggling free of his grasp. Just to be sure, I repeated with another smile, turning to begin the ascent, and praying I wasn't miscalculating. The stairs rose indifferently before me, quickly rounding a corner that I hoped concealed the hotel entrance. From the outside, the hotel appeared to start on the second floor, but I didn't actually know for sure. A burnt-out light bulb overhead dangled from a frayed cord. A few cockroaches lay at my feet, their legs forever upturned in petrified agony, and a potential attacker debated his next move at my back. My heart was pounding, and I was covered in sweat. Still, trusting that the end to my nightmarish introduction to Morocco was a mere flight or two away, I started climbing. Was the thug following me? Was I a fool for letting down my defenses? Or had I called his bluff? What if I got to the lobby and the hotel really was full? What was I going to do then? It won't be. It won't be, I reassured myself, refusing to be had by the second belligerent con artist I'd encountered in less than an hour in the country. Three quarters of the way up the first flight of stairs, no one had attacked me from behind. I rounded the corner, proceeded up another half flight, and discovered what I had desperately hoped to find. A hotel lobby. The reception area was dim and musty, with a pungent odor of stale tobacco. It didn't matter. Beaming as I was on the inside, the entire lobby may as well have been a glow in a heavenly light. I didn't even need to see my room. I was home. Getting up from his seat amongst a group of young men watching a soccer match, a friendly older gentleman checked me in and showed me to my room. It was simple and run down, with no bathroom. At least it had a sink with running water, and it was large and more or less clean. It also had the charm of high ceilings with decorative moldings that recalled better days, as well as two sets of French doors. Each set opened onto its own small balcony overlooking the plaza. Standing on one of the balconies, I contemplated Tangier for the first time. Directly below, as well as Kitty Corner to my hotel, men sat at outdoor cafes, conversing over cups of coffee and glasses of mint tea. Interspersed with the locals, I spied a few tourists, including a Danish couple I recognized from the ferry trip over. There were all sorts of small shops, the fabric store in plain sight, several food vendors, and never-ending streams of people coming and going in all directions. Men for the most part, some were dressed in traditional robe-like garments and pointy leather shoes, whereas others wore t-shirts or button-downs and blue jeans or slacks. Food was being cooked with unfamiliar yet enticing spices, cigarettes were going up in smoke faster than kindling on a bonfire, and a saltiness on the air recalled the proximity to the sea. Too exhausted to take in any more, I closed the shutters, left one of the French doors cracked to let in some air, and pulled down the sheets. Collapsing as though finally succumbing to the weight of the trials and tribulations I'd endured on my odyssey from the port, at long last I was able to savor the fact I had made it. Having been hassled, lied to, insulted, and threatened, I was safe and sound in my own hotel room. Despite the unrelenting buzz of activity outside, and the sporadic outbursts of the young men in the lobby, my eyelids were soon struggling against the same weight that had knocked me off my feet moments before. I heard the frenzied cheers when one of the soccer teams scored a goal, 
But by the time they died back down, I had already fallen into one of the deepest slumbers of my life. It was a good thing, too. I would need to be as fully rested as possible for what was to come. <laughs>